Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question asks if I can discuss the mental health and personality factors that may be at work in the life and death of Anna Nicole Smith. Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I'll put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. So I'll look here at the background of Anna Nicole Smith and then move to the mental health and personality factors. Anna Nicole Smith was born Vicki Lynn Hogan in Houston, Texas on November 28, 1967. She was primarily raised by her mother and her aunt, and she had five half-siblings. After her mother married in 1971, Smith changed her name to Nikki Hart. Smith went to high school where she failed her freshman year and she dropped out altogether during her sophomore year. In April of 1985, when she was 17, she married a cook who worked at the same restaurant where she worked, and she had a son named Daniel in early 1986. Smith would divorce her husband in February of 1993. Now moving back to October of 1991, Smith met a man named J. Howard Marshall II. He was 86 years old. Marshall was a lawyer and went on to make a fortune in the oil business. Right before he met Smith, he was despondent because his second wife and a longtime mistress had both died. In order to cheer him up, his chauffeur drove him to a club where Smith happened to work. Now, by this time, Marshall was in a wheelchair. Smith danced for him, and they immediately fell in love. They probably connected at a profound level after deep conversations about philosophy. There was only about a 63-year age gap between them, so hardly noticeable. Now, the two started dating, and Marshall repeatedly asked Smith to marry him as he bought her expensive gifts. In 1992, now being funded by Marshall, Smith appeared in the magazine Playboy. She worked on an ad campaign for Guest Jeans. After that, this is when she changed her name to Anna Nicole Smith. Following this, Smith appeared in a variety of magazines and found work as a model. In 1994, she appeared in her first movie, named The Hudsucker Proxy, but she was probably more remembered for her appearance in the film Naked Gun 33 and a Third, The Final Insult, which was released just a week after her first film. Smith and Marshall married in June 1994. In August of 1995, Marshall died at the age of 90. After this, Smith sued in an attempt to get half of Marshall's estate. She said that she was promised that by Marshall in exchange for marrying him. Lawsuits on this issue would go on for several years. In 1996, Smith filed bankruptcy because she had an $850,000 judgment against her for sexual harassment of a nanny that worked for her. It was a default judgment, meaning that it was issued because Smith did not answer the complaint or appear in court. The lawsuits over the inheritance continued, going all the way to the United States Supreme Court, which ruled in favor of Smith, but the victory was that she could pursue her case in federal court. The case would not be resolved during Smith's lifetime. Her estate took over after her death, but eventually the estate lost the case. Now going back to 1995, she was in the movie To the Limit. This was a leading role for her, but it would be the only one of her career, as the movie failed at the box office miserably, and many people believed her acting was atrocious. And I would be compelled to agree, she was not an effective actress. Smith was in a few more movies, but for the next few years, she shifted her efforts to television, and in August of 2002, she starred in her own reality show on the E! Cable Network. It would be canceled in June of 2003. In that same year, she worked for a company that made weight loss products, both the company and Smith were sued for promoting misleading information about weight loss pills that the company sold. In November of 2004, Smith was on the American Music Awards, and her job was to introduce Kanye West. She was appearing live on that broadcast. During her appearance, she demonstrated unusual behavior, including slurring her speech. Smith's representatives tried to explain away the incident by saying that she was suffering due to a series of challenging fitness workouts. I guess something like lifting glasses of alcohol. I don't know what the workouts involved. In April 2006, Smith was treated by a psychiatrist who said that she had borderline personality disorder. 
the psychiatrist was treating Smith after she withdrew from Xanax and methadone. Smith said that she stopped cold turkey because she found out she was pregnant. Smith gave birth to a daughter in September 2006. Apparently, she had entered into a romantic relationship with her attorney. His name was Howard K. Stern, not to be confused with the radio host, Howard Stern. Smith was not 100% sure that Stern was the father. However, she was fairly confident that he was. This started a debate that lasted for some time. A number of men came forward and claimed that they were, in fact, the father of Smith's child. A photographer named Larry Burkhead said that he was the father. A man named Frederick Prince von Anhalt, this was Zsa Zsa Gabor's husband, came forward and said he might have been the father. And so did a man named Alexander Denk, who had once worked as Smith's bodyguard. So we see a surprising number of people trying to establish paternity in this case. Usually when a child is born, we don't see quite this much activity. Three days after the birth of Smith's daughter, her son Daniel died at age 20. He died from a number of substances in his system, including antidepressants and methadone. He actually died in Smith's hospital room in the Bahamas. She was there recovering from the birth of her daughter. He was visiting her during that time. About three weeks later, Smith and Stern had a commitment ceremony on a catamaran in the Bahamas. In mid-October, her son Daniel was buried. At the funeral, Smith tried to climb into Daniel's coffin, saying that if he has to be buried, she wanted to be buried with him. On February 8, 2007, Anna Nicole Smith was found dead in her room at a hotel in Hollywood, Florida. She was 39 years old. Her death was caused by a number of substances that she had in her system, including chlorohydrate, Ativan, Clonopin, Valium, Cerax, Topamax, and Benadryl. The autopsy showed that she had consumed methadone as well, but it was two to three days prior to her death, and it did not play a part in her death. None of the substances were illicit, but the majority were not prescribed to her. Now moving to the mental health and personality factors. The difficulty with Anna Nicole Smith in terms of figuring out what's going on with her personality is that she really did appear to be different in person than she did in public. We see a number of people have said this. Let's take a look at her potential personality profile using the five-factor model. I remember the five factors through the acronym OCEAN, openness to experience, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. So looking at openness to experience, I would say that Anna's level was probably quite high. She was adventurous. She experienced emotions intensely, but it's not clear how much fantasy she had or how creative she was. In terms of intellectual curiosity, she stated that she was not very intelligent, and those two constructs are positively correlated to a small degree, but she did appear to be somewhat intellectually curious. In terms of conscientiousness, she would have a low level. She was not cautious or responsible, although she was quite productive. As far as extroversion, her level was high. This one is difficult to figure out because of that whole private versus public persona issue. Several people said that Smith was actually reserved and shy, but clearly her public persona seemed fearless, outgoing, friendly, assertive, and excitement-seeking. I think in weighing everything, it's reasonable to believe she had higher than average extroversion. As far as agreeableness, we see a mid-range score. She was trusting and altruistic, but she could also be antagonistic, controlling, and demanding. That brings us to neuroticism. Her score was probably high. She seemed to be somewhat depressed, and she had difficulty resisting temptation. Now, in terms of mental health, we see that, as I mentioned before, her psychiatrist said that she had borderline personality disorder. This disorder is characterized by symptoms like impulsivity related to self-harm, a tumultuous relationship style, a fear of abandonment, a feeling of emptiness, emotional dysregulation, and anger. It's hard to know what's going on here. I can see how somebody could make an argument for this, but her behavior really doesn't seem to line up, in my opinion, with borderline personality features. Like we see impulsivity, but there's no evidence of self-harm, at least not in what I could find. Also with borderline, we often see suicidal behavior. She certainly took risks with substances, but I don't really see anything that rises to the level of that. Now, I guess if we had more information about the relationships, like exactly what went on in the relationships, that would give us more information speaking to the idea of a tumultuous relationship style. Was there a 
pattern of idealizing a partner and then rejecting a partner. There's some evidence of that, but it's really not clear. So again, I could see how somebody could make the argument, but I think one could also make an argument for symptoms of depression. The difficulty, of course, is that there's overlap between borderline and depression. For example, Smith once said that she liked fast men, fast cars, and fast food. Well, that mentality could line up with borderline or depression. The emotional dysregulation from borderline or the attempt to break out of a depressed episode, right, by looking for excitement. So it's difficult to know. Some speculate that Smith had substance use disorder. I don't know if she had the disorder or not, but it does seem clear that she used substances excessively. As is the case when somebody uses a lot of substances, it makes it difficult to figure everything else out as far as potential mental health characteristics. The substances really did seem to be a significant part of her life. At one point, she said that she overdosed on prescription narcotics and went into a coma. So it wasn't like she was clean of all substances leading up to her death. The substances in her system at the time of her death did appear to be part of a pattern of behavior that had been occurring for some time. I find it interesting that Smith was taking so many substances that had a sedative effect, like she was perhaps having difficulty sleeping. This is a pattern we have seen many times before with a number of celebrities, including Marilyn Monroe, Michael Jackson, and Elvis Presley. One of the things that's often talked about with Smith is the lawsuit over the inheritance and how this lawsuit went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court and the majority decision was actually written by Ruth Bader Ginsburg. One of the questions that comes up related to these legal battles was this. Was Smith using Marshall or was Marshall using her? Well, it's hard to know. I think it seems reasonable to believe that they were both using each other. There was never any evidence produced showing Marshall said he would give half of his estate to Smith. Some have said that it's hard to believe Smith would have stayed with him if there wasn't some type of financial commitment. But I don't think this is the case. We know from the court proceedings that Marshall spent millions of dollars on Smith. That seems to be incentive enough to stay with him, even if her motive was purely financial. It's hard to believe there was really any other motive in this particular case. I think this is an example of sexual economics theory taken to the maximum. So you have somebody like Anna Nicole Smith who is fairly attractive and fairly young, and you have somebody like Marshall who was quite old and also quite wealthy. So they each had a lot to offer, but out toward the extremes. So they end up together and it seems unusual, but it might have just been an arrangement that they both went into kind of knowing what was really going on, right? They both agreed to the terms, seeing everything relatively clearly. They both had to know that they weren't going to be living a long life together, like looking forward to a number of anniversaries. If they had made it to their silver anniversary, Marshall would have been 114. In one of the trials, Smith testified that it was very expensive to be her. After she was asked how she spent $100,000 of Marshall's money in a week, right? So Again, Marshall became quite wealthy. He probably didn't do that by spending money excessively. It seems reasonable to believe he knew what Smith was doing and how much she was spending, and he approved that. So there does seem to be some type of arrangement that was worked out. I was trying to think of how to sum up Smith's life. Like, what was the theme in her life and in her death? The word that came to mind was excess. This word comes up a lot when talking about celebrity deaths. There was just too much of everything, too many substances, too much fame, too quickly. She was in a relationship with someone who was over 60 years older and worth millions of dollars. Some would argue billions. That was debated in court. Her spending was excessive. There were too many court proceedings going all the way up to the Supreme Court. There was too much chaos. Everything in Smith's life was taken to the maximum. It's almost like if somebody was driving a car and they could only push their foot all the way down on the accelerator or all the way down the brake. So just a situation that causes damage to the person driving and potentially to many people around them. Those are my thoughts on Anna Nicole Smith. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be interesting. Thanks for watching.